Hey, welcome back, Faithful Politics listeners and watchers. If you're watching us on our YouTube channel, we're glad to have you. I am your political host, Will Wright, and I'm joined by my partner in crime, your faithful host, Pastor Josh Bertram. How's it going, Josh? Doing great. Thanks, Will. And today we have with us Dr. Guy Golan, who's an associate professor, author, and public speaker, over 20 years of ex expertise in political communication, international relations. He is the co-author of My Brother's Keeper, The Complicated Relationship Between American Jews and Israel. And he's here to talk to us about all the things related to <laughs> like Jewish, Jew, American, whatever, uh, that that we can tap them, tap them for. So welcome to the show, Guy. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Um, I, I have to start first by just asking you this, this, I don't know, hopefully it won't be an offensive question. <laughs> <laughs> but like, like you, you co-author this book, My Brother's Keeper, with another individual named Guy. Yes. But tell me about that, because that another just... <laughs> another professor named Guy who just happens to also be originally from Israel and also live in Dallas. He is he is oh, a amazing. history professor, so he's a history professor, PhD from Yale. He's a smart one in the group, and I am. I do political comms. So just like the two of you are great yin and yang, so are Guy and I. That's awesome. I love that. You know, what an interesting book that you've written for us. Man, I would love for you to kind of break down the premise, the main thesis of the book, and, and, and maybe a few of your sub-arguments, kind of just helping us understand, like, what is the book? Why did you write it? And uh, yeah, what's the what's kind of the main big message you're trying to get across? Sounds great. Let's do it. So um, all around the world, uh, there are big two large Jewish tribes. One lives in Israel. One lives in the United States, roughly eight million each. The two tribes could not be more different than one another. Israelis, Israeli Jews are a majority within their land. American Jews are a minority within a Christian land. They both have a completely different uh, social psychology, political psychology, and those differences lead to a lot of tensions, which make their relationship with one another complicated. Uh, it looks like you're muted, Well. So while Will uh, fixes the mic, I'll just go yeah. on and explain that the book was written because everybody has an opinion about Israel. Everybody talks about Israel. Nobody understands anything about Israel. Most people know very little about it, including American Jews. So when Christians who live in the United States need advice and want to know what's going on with Israel, they go to American Jews for advice and they're going to the absolute wrong place because their Jewish neighbors are simply not familiar with the state of Israel. Yeah, that is fascinating. You know, it, it seems like one of the tensions that you're trying to bring out in the main argument is that this relationship between American Jews and Israel is pretty complex and it's potentially strained. Maybe you might say, or there's misunderstanding there. And it's interesting because I think about in the history of Jews, this isn't necessarily new uh, in the sense that like the Hellenists in the first uh, century BC and first century AD and, and the kind of tension that was felt in the nation of Israel over those who were loyal and Hellenistic in their outlook and those who were more maybe traditionalist and things, uh, sects like the Pharisees and things like that can come out. And it's interesting to think about uh, those kinds of connections, I, I would love for you to help me understand. I, I kind of understand the, you know, some of the tensions between the Hellenists and the, uh, and the traditional Jews in the first century, because mm -hmm. I've studied a lot of that and read that. What, what, what might be those equivalents today, thinking about these two groups and maybe the uh, tensions that are there? Josh, it's a great question. I, I think a lot of the same tensions exist, only now we have iPhones. So um, just like many other uh, religious groups or people around the world, there is a tension between um, the nationalist religious nature of uh, Jews in Israel, so who are very proud of both being very nationalistic and very more religious, 
and the more secular, more globalist, more humanistic nature of the American Jews who look forward. So, you know, you have one group who's looking, is looking to the past for guidance and another group who's looking uh, to the future for guidance. I think this tension really is common all around the world. We see it within American politics. We see it within European politics. We even see it, you know, all across you know, other societies. But in Israel, particularly, because it's much smaller, it comes to fruition a lot more. You know, can, can you hear me now? Can Absolutely. Me? Yes. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm curious if and maybe we can just sort of define some terms here. Um, sure. So when when we say somebody is Jewish or somebody is a Jew, like what what are we conveying about that person? Okay, that's a great question. So our first chapter asks a simple question. Are Jews a nation, right? A people, an ethnicity, or a religion? And this is seems a very straightforward question, but if you ask people in the two major tribes uh, of Israel, they're going to have different answers. So uh, let's talk about American Jews first. About 70% of American Jews fall under the larger umbrella of Reform Jews. And this includes conservative Jews, constructivist Jews, and so on. Um, what does this mean? During the emancipation period in the 1800s in Europe, Jews were offered a deal. And the deal was very simple. If you want to be citizens of Holland, France, England, take off those funny hats, stop acting differently than everybody else, and become regular Europeans, right? So a lot of Jews back then changed the way they practiced Judaism, right? They started drive. oh, they didn't drive, but they rode their horses to synagogue on Saturday, which, you know, is forbidden. And uh, they, they took their children out of Jewish schools and they put them into regular schools. And, you know, they adopted more of the uh, lifestyles of their Christian neighbors. And when American Jews came to the United States in the early 1900s, again, from Central Europe, most of them, and Russia, they had the same deal in the United States. And the reform movement allowed American Jews to intermarry and still stay within the faith, to drive to synagogue on Saturday, to not keep kosher, and to become regular Americans. And this emancipation led to the success of American Jews who became as American as apple pie. In Israel, you don't have that. There, there really are no reformed Jews in Israel. In Israel, you just have Jews, right? There are a lot of secular Jews, a lot of uh, traditional Jews, but they're just Jews. They didn't change the practice of Judaism. They just choose. So we have the salad bar metaphor in our book, right? In Israel, the salad bar is the same salad bar it has been on for the last 5,000 years. Same Judaism. And people kind of pick and choose how much they want to take for themselves. On the other hand, in the United States, there is an attempt to change the actual ingredients of the salad bar. So American Jews, because they want to be accepted into the coalition of the oppressed, which really began in the days of FDR, we could talk about that, they, uh, for them, inclusivity, right? And getting along with other people and, and, and really erasing differences between groups is really important. And they, bring, they try to bring that into the practice of Judaism itself. So they change their prayer books, they change their practice, and the two versions of Judaism are very different. Interesting. No, th th that that's really helpful because, like, I, I just don't know. I mean, I'm I'm not a Jew, and but I I I, oft, I often seek, you know, ways to just be more respectable to respectful of of folks that you know come from a different place than I do. And and I and I'm and I want to ask you a little bit about just anti-Semitism and like what that what that means. But before I before I do, like, um, I've always kind of thought. You know, like I'm, I'm not one to call something anti-Semitic because I don't think I've got a firm enough understanding of what that word means and how it affects people. Much in the same way that, like, you know, during the George Floyd protest, I had a lot of people reach out to me and be like, "Is it racist for me to call you black?" You know, and I'm like, "I don't know." Like, no, I don't think so. But like, but but different people of color have different um, tolerances, you know, for what they consider. Uh, is racist. So I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on like, when we say something is anti-Semitic, like, what are we, like, what are we offending? Who are we offending? Um, and is this just like a, just like an American thing? 
Oh, or is this is this more global? Oh no, I mean anti-Semitism is pretty much as old as you know. You can go back thousands of years. What's really unique about the United States and anti-Semitism is that unlike Europe, where anti-Semitism was a national sport, right? I mean, if there was any, there was a recession, there was a plague, if there was any trouble, governments would send their people to go and burn Jewish villages. The United States is the greatest nation on earth. Here, we never had, never, ever, 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 ever institutionalized anti-Semitism. That, that means a U.S. government never used hate for, for the Jews as a political tool. Now, of course, some people don't like Jews in the United States, and that's okay. Not everybody likes everybody, right? Uh, what you see right now on college campuses and in big cities and in the um, pro-Hamas uh, uh, demonstrations that are happening on the streets is a new form of anti-Semitism. And that is hatred, hatred for the Jewish people that extends beyond policy, right? And, uh, you know, go, Will, to go back to your question, you know, I'm not an expert on what racism is, what anti-Semitism is, and what any other form of hatred is. Basically, when you use a different measuring stick for different people, right, especially in a negative way, I think that's wrong. And I think it goes against the American way. That's amazing. You know, I when I'm thinking about what you're talking about, um, I'm thinking about the college campuses, you know, because I've heard this quite a bit about anti-Semitism that's being displayed and manifest on college campuses. And I would love for you to go into more depth on that. Kind of, is there something unique about this problem that we haven't seen? You called it a new form of anti-Semitism. And if so, what what is that uniqueness? What makes that unique? And then even some of the concepts and assumptions that are happening in this anti-Semitist movement, Semitic sure. movements. Go ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So for the longest time, you know, when people thought about anti-Semitism in Israel, they thought about the far right. They thought about, you know, the KKK, right? And, and that was a history 100 years ago. What is unique about the new anti-Semitism is that it's, it's coming from the left and not from the right. And here, it's really important to understand. The majority of American Jews belong to the left. The majority of American Jews vote for the left. In every single election in the United States in the last, you know, since FDR, the majority of American Jews voted for Democratic candidates. So Jews were always a part of the left and always a part of social justice. When you look at early rights movements like labor rights, civil rights, uh, LGBTQ rights, trans rights, Arab, you know, protecting against Islamophobia, you always see Jews right there in the center. What has changed, and this is a relatively new phenomenon, about 10 years ago, is that there is a new narrative on college campuses. And the new narrative comes from the critical uh, race theory, critical studies, post-colonialism, neo-Marxism, and it pretty much divides the world into two, part, two people, oppressor and oppressed, right? A very simplistic way of explaining very complicated topics. And when it comes to the topic of Israel, the Jews are taught in college campuses to be the oppressors, people who are colonialists, people who have no historical connection to the land of Israel, right? And they moved to Israel in started a new country called Israel on a land that they had no historical ties to based on colonial white supremacy. Now, this is what they teach in college campuses, in Columbia, at Penn, and some of the Ivy League schools, and the, the post-colonial professors are the ones to do it. There is only like 200 problems with this thesis. First of all, Jews have always lived in Israel, and we have tons of archaeology to demonstrate that Jews were physically in Israel thousands of years. Second, you know, to call Jews white supremacist is kind of an ironic thing. You know, first of all, you know, <laughs> the hatred towards Jews because they are non-whites across Europe, and as I mentioned early on by the KKK, clearly demonstrates the Jews were never accepted into that you know, the, that majority group. Second thing, most Israelis are not from Europe. Most Israelis, you know, the Jews and Christians have always lived all across the Middle East. 
uh, Jews lived in Yemen and in the Arabian Peninsula and in Iraq and in Iran thousands of years, way before Islam. And you know how we know that? Because in the Quran, there are battles where the Prophet Muhammad goes to war with the Jews. So Jews and Christians have always been a part of the Middle East, and about 50% of Israelis are from either Northern Africa, so countries like Tunisia, Morocco, Libya, or countries like Yemen, Iraq, and Turkey, right? So this is the new narrative of anti-Semitism. It's, 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 it's full of holes, but it plays really well into the larger narrative that pretty much blames the United States, Starbucks, and Israel for every single problem that's happening across the world. Well, um, I'm not going to push back on the Starbucks comment because <laughs> um, I'm just not. But 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 I, I do want to ask about, you know, like you 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 talked about sort of the the role of maybe professors on a lot of college campuses and, you know, kind of creating this, I don't know, perception of of Israel and and Jews and, and whatnot. And I and, and I I'd love to kind of just maybe dig a little bit deeper into that. Like, like what, what are protesters getting wrong um, about say, especially what's happening in, in Gaza right now? I mean, I, I, I'd be the first to say that it's, it's a very complicated situation um, is I'm, I'm in the camp and I, and I'm a liberal, like I'm, I'm in the camp that Israel has a right to defend itself um, on the same token, like they are killing a lot of people. So, like, sure. and that's not funny. I just that's that's how I that's how I react to things. Well, um, it's, it's it's heartbreaking, right? So, so let's talk about. It. First of all, let's identify who the protesters are. Okay, you you see these college campuses, and you're going to identify the strangest coalition in the history of political coalitions of all times. You essentially have two main groups who are protesting, you know on college campuses and on the streets and, and against the DNC these days, right? The people who call uh, Kamala Harris killer Kamala or the people who refer to Joe Biden as genocide Joe. On one hand, you have the Islamists. These are Arab American and Muslim um, immigrants, first generation, second generation immigrants to the United States. And their sympathies is for Hamas. They don't view Israel as a legitimate country and they really think that Israel needs to go away, including the people who live there, right? They want to send us back to Europe, despite the history, right? The second group, and, and this is where the irony comes, are social justice warriors from the, the, the LGBTQ circles, from the trans rights movement, from the people who supported uh, BLM. Now, the problem with this coalition, the reason why it's so irrational, is that every single social justice principle that the people from the progressive left believe in, women's rights, gay rights, trans rights, equality for all people, uh, not treating people differently based on their religion, every single one of those principles is completely and utterly rejected by every single person who is uh, demonstrated along with them people who support Hamas and Hezbollah and the Muslim Brotherhood and ISIS and believe that Islam should be the thing that guides all politics in the world, they don't believe in gay rights, trans rights, women's rights. They don't believe in freedom of difference, right? If you disagree with them, you are a sinner and your faith is not a good one. So this ridiculous, ridiculous coalition we see on college campuses, right, makes no sense. So you, you see, you know, the, the queers for Palestine wearing the kafia. The kafia is the symbol of Muslim resistance against Christians and non-believers. Ironic. It, it, the the kafia just, just real fast, is is that the like the checkered looking like red and white or black and white thing? Uh, there, there are many colors and different uh, movements within the Arab world use them differently. The Jordanians, different one than the Palestinian one, than the Syrian ones, etc. But in the context of the demonstrations, right, where people are literally yelling, we will bring the intifada here. Intifada means armed resistance. Okay, you have people burning American flags 
on the streets of New York, in D.C., and on college campuses, in rising, raising the flag of Hamas, Hezbollah, ISIS. What is going on here? That is wild. It's absolutely wild. You know, you you have been talking about this idea of the disillusionment almost of kind of American Jews having this weird uh, coalition now or, or, or even like feeling like they're struggling to belong within the Democrat Party, which they traditionally supported. I'd love for you to go deeper into that. Like, like what is causing these shifts? Is it is it the uh, alignment or coalition of these kind of more radical left LGBTQ or, or various different groups with Hamas that is causing this tension? Has the tension been there for a while? What's what's uh, really going on if you uh, open the hood and, and look in there? Well, first of all, uh, the mainstream Democratic Party is 100 percent pro we just had the DNC conference, and everybody from Harris to even AOC, they stood on the stage and they said, we support Israel and its right to defend itself, right? AOC totally sold out her supporters, right? But she's, she's going to run for Senate in a couple of years. So she, needs, she needs the support. But the mainstream Democratic Party is 100% pro-Israel. Joe Biden said, I am a Zionist, and he sent the money, and he sent the support, right? And the Dem mainstream Democratic Party is pro-Israel and the American Jews who belong to it feel very good over there. The problem is on the progressive left and the social justice movement. I told you, Jews have always been a part of social justice, always, always, always. And now for the first time, American Jews are provided with a new litmus test that says, look, if you want to be a part of the social justice movement, you can be pro-Israel. And this is a new thing, and this is causing a lot of people in the American left, a real cognitive dissonance because they see themselves as progressives and they just don't know what to do with the new hatred. That's, that's really wild. Um, I mean, it, it, it definitely makes me think because I consider myself somewhat progressive. Um, I mean, but I don't hate anybody really. Um, so I'm not sure who these, who these other, you know, people are, but I mean, all these haters will. <laughs> I know. I mean, All these it's, it's, it's one of those things where like, I, I can appreciate the nuance and, and all the demonstrations. I mean, I, I won't, I won't probably change my view about Israel has a right to defend itself, like full stop, but like, I'll have commentary about, Hey, you can't be killing 40,000 people, you know, indiscriminately. <laughs> like, That's, like, well, but we'll let's, let's talk about that real quick. Okay. Mm -hmm. Look, when democracies fight terror organizations, they're fighting a really ironic battle because when the United States fought in Afghanistan or in Iraq, or when Israel fights in Gaza, you have an incredibly crazy situation. Hamas benefits from the death of civilians. The more civilians that die in Gaza, right? The more Hamas get support from the international community. And, and here's the crazy thing. Israel is the only military in the history of the world that pre-announces its attacks. It, it clears out citizens right from areas and says, listen, we're about to attack here, please leave. Now, when the Russians and the Syrians were dropping fuel bombs on Syrian civilians, did you hear anything in the news media about this? Did you hear any outcry? Half a million people died, civilians. When half a million civilians died in the, in the conflict in Sudan, did you see any demonstrations on the left? Did you see any people uh, going to college campuses and tearing stuff up? And in Yemen, civil war, half a million civilians almost died, oh, more than a million displaced. We heard nothing. Now look, the situation in Gaza is terrible. Terrible. Why is the war not stopping today? Because they're holding on to teenage girls who they took hostage, who they mass raped together, and because they want to stay in power. Hamas, right? The Palestinian people are the victims of Hamas. They're the victim of the jihadist movement that wants to establish 
jihadist or Islamic law in Palestine. And one more thing, they are nothing but a tool for the Iranians. Iran is fighting proxy wars in Lebanon. Look at Lebanon, completely destroyed, taken over by Hezbollah. Hezbollah or a Shiite military funded and supported by Iran. Look at Yemen, the devastation, millions of people displaced, half a million people died. Why? Because a small Shiite group supported by Iran went to war against the Sunni majority. And we see these in Syria, we see these proxy wars in Iraq. And look, look, let's say everybody's always like, oh, if, if Israel left the Palestine, let's say all the Jews moved to Boca Raton. What's going to happen in the Middle East? You're going to see wars going on because the real battle in the Middle East is not between Israel and the Palestinians. It's between the Sunnis and the Shiite. This war has been going on for over a thousand years. And if you look at the casualty numbers, take all the Israeli Arab wars, all of them combined, the number of Arab casualties is lower than the war in Iraq, the war in Syria, the war in uh, Sudan, and the war in uh, Yemen. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. I mean, I think you and I are on the same page with regards to, you know, Hamas is a is a bad actor. They don't care anything about their people. You know, I would say it's it's like, I don't know, 80, 20, the fault of Hamas that so many people have have died, um, you know, and, and have having having been to war like I, I served in the army and went to Iraq back in 2003. Like, I understand that just casualties are just going to be a thing that that happens I, I i think what 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 really sort of changes the equation for me is just you know tax dollars like you know we've got bombs with american names on them you know being being dropped and and it's like for me that just it it, it seems to stand out more and maybe like the the amount of money we give to israel i mean like no one ever talks about Myanmar, right? Um, <laughs> like, and, and they basically are, have a genocide there um, as well. So um, I, I think for me personally, it's just, it's just, it's just the, the money we send over there, how it's being used, you know, and, and yeah, and, and it's unfortunate loss of life. And I wish, I wish we would just like fly a bunch of like posters or flyers like over and tell all the people <laughs> that, like if you bring me this guy i'll give you a free ride out of here uh to boca raton or something listen uh, but listen you know here let, let's go back let's go back to the problem and you know i i think this is where our book really uh brings a unique perspective israel serves as a fantastic metaphor for global tensions and and i want you to think about how unique israel is within the west so after world war ii Europe moved from the far right to the far left, right? So after fascism, they replaced it with a new ideology called globalization. And they said to Europeans, you are no longer Italians and Spaniards and Germans and Frenchmen. You are Europeans. You no longer have the franc and the lira and the peso. You have the euro. There are no more borders between the countries. Everybody can work anywhere they want, right? So Europe rejects two things. Nationhood, nationalism, because they thought nationalism is what brought World War II, and religion. So Europe becomes, you know, one of the most secular uh, geographies in the world. So the new ideology called the globalization, right, and global humanistic, you know, everybody, everybody's the same, everybody can move anywhere and become equal citizens of that country. When, you know, so you can land from Sweden tomorrow, from Afghanistan, and you're just a Swede as a guy whose father was in Vikings season three. But there's a problem. There is one country in the West that says, no, 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 no. We are not giving up on our nationalism. We're proud of our flag. We're not giving up on our religion. We are proud of our religion. And you, you said, Will, something very important. You said, you know, I know that the United States has their names written on the bombs in Yemen and in Syria and in Iraq and in Afghanistan. And I'm okay with that, but it, it hurts me when it goes to Israel. Why is that? Because think about it. Israel serves as a daily reminder to the Western world that the values that they seek to abandon are still relevant and still salient. And now if you've been following European elections, 
all across, in Italy, in Holland, in France, in Germany, you see the rise of the right. And the right is asking for something simple. We want a country for our people. We want nationalism back. We want to put our flag back. And we want to have control over our country instead of the bureaucrats in Brussels. So this is why Israel is such a thorn in the butt of the West and of, liber of Western politics, of uh, leftist politics. And this is why this country gets so much attention, much more attention than most countries around the world. So I listen to you and I'm absolutely fascinated and I face an internal tension and a problem. And let me see if I can articulate this well. Essentially, I'm thinking, I, I'm hearing you speak and, and, and it's making a lot of sense to me, the things that you're saying. And I'm wondering, you know, where does someone like me, how am I able to access the kind of information and data that let me come to the conclusions that you have come to without necessarily relying on you having to tell me? I mean, obviously, I would want to know your opinion. You're an expert in this. I want to hear it. Yeah, I love to... And, and primarily to hear the way a great mind works and thinks about these really significant issues. But if I'm like, you know, out of this conversation and then I hear someone at the gym and they're telling me they're murdering, it's genocide, there's all this stuff. And I hear the same data interpreted a different way. How can I distinguish between the two to come to the place as an American to say, yeah, I I I think Guy is right. I think he's the one with the opinion that I should that I should adopt. What what what, can, well, what tools the first do we have? To do, what can we do? Well, the first thing you can do is uh, get a copy of this book, My Brother's Keeper. Yes, complicated yes. relationship. Uh, no, just kidding. Look, most Americans, the vast majority of Americans, support Israel, and it doesn't matter Democrats, Republicans, Independents. The American uh, public opinion goes with Israel. Why? Because Israel is a part of the Western world, and so is the United States. We share the same values. Uh, I think you, Josh, particular as, as a pastor, as a person of faith, I think you have a deeper relationship with the state of Israel. Because in this, you know, in our book, we have two really cool chapters. One of them is called "Why Do Evangelical Christians." love the Jews. Not Israel necessarily, but the Jews. And the second one is, why do American Jews distrust evangelical Christians? <laughs> and, and this is a really interesting thing. So let me just tell, share some information most people don't know. About. When it comes to supporting the Jewish people, there is not a single group who is more dedicated to this cause than evangelical Christians. When it comes to fighting the BDS movement, the boycott, uh, divest, and sanction movement, and all the academic boycotts and all the, all the hatred on college campuses, it's evangelical Christians who stand in the front line, and they are the ones who are passing legislation in state governments, right, all across the country against those movements. Why is that? Why are evangelical Christians so committed to the state of Israel and to Jewish people, right? So this is really an important question. It, it shapes Republican politics. It also shapes uh, mainstream democratic politics. And the answer is, and I think you can answer this question better than I, that, you know, because evangelical Christians, people of the book, you know, those who will bless Israel will be blessed and those who will curse him will be cursed, right? That, that promise to Abraham that God made is so important and so significant. And, and I even want to show you an even more ironic twist in this plot. When American Jews and even secular Israelis, right, people who live in Tel Aviv and are just, you know, trading crypto and Bitcoin, right, and all of that, when they hear the names Bethlehem or Bethel or, you know, any in Nazareth, right, for them, you know, the secular people, they think, oh, the occupied territories, right? This, you know, these are, these lands don't belong to us. These are Arab lands. 
right? And, and this really supports, that's why, you know, if somebody says, hey, you're a colonialist, if you're secular and you're, if you're not familiar with the name, right, of Jericho, right, or Shiloh or any of those, you're like, okay, yeah, those are Arab towns. But if you read the book, right, if you listen to the word of God, if you understand that Jesus walked in those places and the Jews have always lived in the land of Israel, in Judea, right, you understand that these are indigenous people. This is a huge difference between evangelicals and American Jews because the secular or the reform American Jews, they're not as familiar with those names as evangelical Christians are. Isn't that ironic? That's really cool. Yeah. You know, speaking of Jericho, that, that's actually my, uh, my oldest son's name. Um, good name. Good name. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I, I definitely agree. It's, it's actually kind of cool. Like when you, when you say those names, the, the connotations differ, right? Depending on where you're kind of from, what your faith background is. Um, I, I don't look it, but I'm also a believer as well. I actually attend Josh's church. Um, sorry, Josh. <laughs> but but I, I am curious, guy, um, like wh what effect do you think, if any, does like Bibi Netanyahu's sort of, I don't know, character, persona, role, do you think play into a lot of, you know, America's anti-Semitism? Um, none. Bibi Netanyahu doesn't lead to anti-Semitism. Um, people who hate Israel on the left hate Bibi. And Bibi is just, you know, Bibi is a proud Jew and a national Jew. So again, those values that the left absolutely hates, right? He is the spokesman spokesman for those values. But when you think about world leaders, if you go right now to Tajikistan or South America, right, or, or somewhere in Africa, and you ask people, who are the five most important world leaders? They're, they're probably going to say Trump, Obama, right? They may say, you know, uh, Giorgio Meloni from Italy, right? Or, or, you know, maybe Berlusconi or, you know, from Italy back in the day, or Lulu from Brazil, or Erdogan from Turkey, but everybody's going to say Bibi Netanyahu. Everybody knows him. Bibi is, has been, is one of the most famous international brands. And what does the brand represent? Nationalism and religion. People who are okay with those two terms, right? Like people on the right love Netanyahu. Netanyahu is a hero of the right in Europe and all across the world. Who despises him the most? The New York Times. <laughs> Yeah. I, do, do you think there's any um, credibility to to a lot of the stuff that that I've been reading? You know, like like Netanyahu has some legal issues and there's some, you know, speculation that he wants the word to be prolonged just to keep himself out of jail. How many times have we heard similar narratives about Biden? right, that Biden is staying in power to protect his son so he doesn't go to jail, or about Trump, that Trump is only doing this or this to stay out of jail. You know, those narratives are not serious. You know, I'm not a huge supporter of Bibi at all. I'm far from it. I've never voted for the guy. I actually worked on the 1999 campaign of Ehud Barak where we defeated Bibi Netanyahu. <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing. Bibi Netanyahu is a patriot. He loves his people, and I don't think a single Israeli leader, no matter from the left or from the right, could have ended the war today. Because what Hamas wants is to stay in power, and no leader can allow them that. Um, last last question before I ask you um, about where people can find your book. But like, how do you, how do you think this whole thing ends over there between <laughs> like Hamas and? In, in Israel, uh, I mean, there are no right or wrong answers, but you know, we've spoken to a lot of um, scholars, professors that look at this stuff and there's like, probably the way it's always ended, like never. <laughs> so, so I'd love to get your thoughts. Well, here's my expert opinion. I have no idea. <laughs> and bottom line is that the war against Hamas, you know, let's say it ends tomorrow. Well, guess what? We're going to have a war with Hezbollah coming up right after it. It's and true. after that, when that's over, we're going to have a war uh, when Jordan falls and Jordan will fall in the next 10 years and become another land of anarchy. Because until Israel or the West 
decides to take out, or Saudi Arabia, for that matter, decide to take out the Iranian Ayatollahs, they are the cause of all of the instability in the Middle East. As long as the Ayatollahs are in power, there'll be war in the Middle East, right? Don't forget, until 1980, 1979, Iran was a friend of the West. And the, the revolution, the Islamic revolution in Iran is behind most of the bloodshed of the last, you know, 40 years. Wow. Well, on that happy note, um, how can people find, find your book, Guy? Thanks so much, guys. Thanks for having me. Of course, you can find it on Amazon and on GuyGoTV.com, where you can find all of my social links as well. Uh, what, what is, what is GuyGoTV? Do, do you have a, a television network? Uh, no, I have a podcast of my own, so yeah. Oh, what's the name of your podcast? The Public Diplomat. I've been podcasting for 12 years already. That's awesome. awesome. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Well, make sure you go pick up the book and go listen to Guy's podcast. Wait, is is the other guy on your podcast as well? Or is it just you? Sometimes, but he's too busy writing uh, smart books about history. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, th thanks again, Guy, for everything. This has been great. Um, yeah, I, I learned a ton. And yes. yeah, good luck. Good luck with the book. Okay. Gentlemen, thanks for having me. Appreciate yeah. it. And we will see you all next time. Remember, keep your conversations not right or left, but up. And we'll see you next time, folks. Take care.